ever done this, and we'd like you to um, sit back, take in what we're going to share with you, because this is something that we'd like you to be able to invite your friends to. All right, so while you're listening and thinking and taking in what, what Ben's going to share with you, think about who you'd like to bring next time, who you'd like to invite to a nice lunch and then invite to a health seminar in the afternoon. I'd just like to say thank you to Ben and Sandra and Julian for coming. They've come from Haverhill Church. I don't know if you know, but in Haverhill they have a great ministry using health. On a Thursday evening, Tuesday evening, once a month, they actually have cookery classes and they're getting quite a lot of people that are coming. And they've done that for quite a while, but it's very successful. They also do health expos and, and they're very much into health in their church and they're using it away, as a way of reaching out into the community. And I think they're doing really well with it. So we are so fortunate that they've come this afternoon to support us and in, encourage us in what we're trying to do. So Ven is going to speak, speak to you this afternoon. Um, he told me I didn't have to introduce him in any other way apart from saying, this is Ven. So this is Ben. <laughs> Please come, Ben. And we're going to invite Richard to come and say a prayer for us. Thank you. Shall we pray? We thank you, dear Father God, for the example of Jesus, who in his ministry in his three and a half years amongst men, went out to help their, and meet their needs, to bring healing, to bring hope, and to then to bring salvation. We thank you that as we start this new project of inviting people for a lunch and a themed thing about health in the afternoon, we pray that we will venture on this with your blessing. Lead and direct as we invite fresh faces, may they respond. But this afternoon, we want to say thank you to, for, to you, for Fen and Sandra, and their willingness to come and share their expertise and their God-given gifts with us today. Bless Fen as he presents to us now. And as we learn, may we also be willing to share we pray in your dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, family. Is this on? Everybody can hear me clearly? Hi, thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Venry Sturlong. Um, I'm a psychology teacher, so I, I really talk for a living. Um, and... Um, this message we came on to, my wife and I, Sandra, uh, about four years ago. Um, and um, we have been sharing as much as we can and growing and sharing. Um, I share this with my, my students, um, every school that I go to. Uh, these days I do supply work. And so therefore, but it is one of those messages of health that I find that they are quite receptive to. Um, and um, we hopefully have been impacting lives. And um, I, I thank you for inviting us to start the program. No pressure, of course, um, seeing that this is the first, and hopefully people will actually return after this one. So what I want to focus on today is the psychology for success, because I think all of us um, has a desire for, um, to be successful. And, um, what I'm finding is that there is, it's not really difficult. There are certain foundational things that are there that we need to be successful. And um, the Bible as well as, as um, science, uh, science is now catching up with the Bible, um, which is thankfully. And we find that we can actually share that message. And I, one of the issues that I don't think that we are as informed as we should be um, to share the message. and. Um, um, I love science, uh, but I also love the Bible, and I believe that they complement each other. Um, and so therefore, hopefully, that I can share that kind of love and enthusiasm with you as well as you go out to minister to others, wherever you are, really. 
So, um, for you were formed, you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. I think this quote is so relevant to what we're going to be talking about here today, but especially this particular area of my focus today, which is our brains. The human brain is simply a fascinating um, subject. Um, and I've been fascinated with the mind and the brain. I, I will use those interchangeably as I go through today from I was um, probably in high school and um, probably used some of um, what I was using at that time, reading at that time in order to trick people into doing things for me. Um, these days I don't do that, but I just share the information with them. Uh, but just a little bit of information about the brain. The brain is probably the most complex and powerful tool. I, I don't want to say machine because um, it is really not a machine, right, um, that we, has ever been created. It, is, it has over a billion neurons and um, probably a trillion synapses in terms of connections in the brain. That, that is just a little gist of it there. So we're talking about synapses, right? So these are the different connections within the brain. Information can travel between the synapses at a speed of 260 miles per second. Um, and it can produce up to 25 um, watts of electricity, enough to actually light a, um, a bulb, right? So it is an amazing thing. Some neurons, they have specialized neurons in the brains that can send up to a thousand signals per second. Uh, this is what we're working with here. Um, there's no supercomputer that actually can come in, in touch with the brain. The brain is far exceeds whatever we're talking about. But we have come a far way in science, and psychology is, is no exception to this rule. There was a thought that genetics was destiny and that the brain was fixed from, um, from you were born or basically once you come into adulthood right through to the rest of your life. Now, with neuroscience and neuroplasticity in, this, um, in particular, we are realizing that the brain is constantly changing. Every single thought, every single perception, every single experience is actually changing the brain. And it's shaping it and fashioning it as we go along. We can actually remember every single episode in our lives. Probably many of us don't want to be able to do that, but the fact of the matter is that we can actually do that. We just know, have to know where we call what we call memory traces. We need to know where um, those memories are stored and how to actually retrieve them. Right? So neuroscience is shedding new light on what the brain is capable of doing. And uh, to me, that is really good news. It means that my genetics, how uh, my, when my parents and, and their parents before them, what I was born with is not fixed. And so therefore, I can actually be doing something in order to be changing that. And of course, naturally, our thought processes is a major part of that. But one of the interesting things about thoughts is that even though scientists and psychologists know a whole lot about the brain in terms of the physiological um, processes, no one has ever seen a thought. Uh, no one has ever seen an idea. But the fact of the matter is that every single thing that came into this world, and I'm going to skip through this, um, came into, into being, first started as a thought or an idea. I don't know many of you have an iPhone, right? But the fact of the matter is before it manifested itself in the material work, it actually existed as a, as a thought first. Steve Jobs and others would have had that as a thought, an idea before it came into being. And if you look at your own, your own, your own lives, Everything that actually 
manifests itself in the material world begins first of all in our minds. And that to me is, is powerful, but at the same time it so shows us how critical it is that we need to even monitor our thoughts. Because every thought, whether good or bad, actually is changing our brains. Is rewiring the, neuro, the, the neurons in our brains and of course that in itself would manifest itself at some point in time. I just want you to kind of take that in for a little bit. Every single thought changes our brain. So what I want to look at today, right, um, and of course that's another um, presentation completely about thoughts and what I've been looking at. People like, um, I've been looking, um, been reading like Bruce Lipton and um, Mesonic, uh, people who are doing um, in neuroplasticity um, are having groundbreaking um, research where this is concerned at this point in time. But I want to focus today on the um, daily habits that sabotage the brain health. Because it's important that our brains remain healthy. So what are some of the things that we do day to day that actually sabotage or help. But before we do that, what is a habit? Anybody has any thought? Um, what, what, what's a habit? Something that you do regularly, yes? Any other thought? Something's formed over time, yes? So something done regularly, formed over time. Ah, almost involuntarily. So that's very good. Any other thoughts? And all of those would be correct, right? Um, if you look at the Merriam-Webster online dictionary, it defines habit as an acquired mode of behavior that has become nearly or completely involuntary, as my brother said. The prevailing disposition or character of a person's thoughts and feelings, a settled tendency or usual manner of behavior, a behavior pattern acquired by frequent repetition or phys physiologic um, exposure. And the last one was interesting, a habit can also be an addiction. But what I want to focus on is a couple lines here. So habits are routine behaviors done on a regular basis. They are recurrent and often unconscious patterns of behavior and are acquired through frequent repetition. Many of these are unconscious as we don't even realize we are doing them. And this one was the one that kind of struck me a little bit. So, so we can see that habits define our character. Hmm. Our thoughts and feelings and our usual behaviors, but our character. So who we are, or who we become, is what we repeatedly do. But more fundamentally, is what we repeatedly think. So, and that probably just leaves you, you know, what are the things that we consistently thinking about? Because ultimately, those are the things that are gonna be shaping not just our thoughts and our characters, but ultimately that will actually determine our destinies as well. So, thoughts can be, our habits can be good or bad, right? And um, James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So, are my bad thoughts from, from me? Or is it from somewhere else? Because this is saying that every good gift, so every good thought then would be from above. So where are our bad thoughts coming from? <laughs> okay, we, we could call it Satan, but, um, um, but also the fact of the, the, the matter that we, we all actually live sinful lives. We're in a sinful world, and so therefore, there are some of those things that surround us as well. All right? So, 
I want to look at um, so these habits that affect our brains, and um, there are some common ones. The mind and the body is connected, and the body and the mind is connected. So, some of the things that we possibly do unconsciously as a habit um, that actually affects our brain. And I'm sure that none of you are guilty of any of these um, above here. So, <laughs> right? All good Adventists um, would practice um, very well all of these things. And so therefore, I'm speaking to the converted. Right? So skipping meals, eating when you're not hungry, sitting too much, watching TV, which are linked, staying up late, stress, and um, um, this one is rehashing stressful events and, of course, um, social media. And I'll, I'll get a little bit more specific with that one. So um, first one, skipping meals. So whether you dash out the door without eating breakfast or you skip lunch in hopes of trimming your waistline, skipping meals could be more harmful than you think. Um, a 2007 study published in Metabolism found that skipping, meal, uh, skipping a meal didn't mean fewer calories. Most people eat more the next meal to make up for it, um, the meal that they skip. Uh, the problems with skipping a meal, however, is that it actually changes, has some metabolic changes that happen in our bodies. Um, after skipping a meal, people experience usually an elevated fasting glucose levels and delayed insulin response. Um, of course, these conditions, I've repeated, can eventually lead to diabetes. And of course, we have an, uh, a massive increase in diabetes too these days. Uh, another study says that it also causes an increased cortisol levels. And cortisol, we're going to look at a, a little later as well, has to do with our stress levels. So in order for the body to produce the type of um, energy that the brain still needs to function, it goes into a kind of a survival mode. And so therefore, it produces cortisol, which is one of those, um, those hormones that actually breaks down um, um, glycogen in the liver in order so you can get glucose, right? So in other words, so the body resorts to survival mode, and so your cortisol levels actually goes up. But there are many things that happen with cortisol that can actually affect your, your body, um, as I said. Um, and um, so we have to be careful in terms of what we're actually doing with that. Um, high cortisol levels um, leads to digestion problems. It leads to naturally higher increased heartbeats, heart rates, all of the different things that are actually associated with a stress response. Of course, this is happening in, at a cellular level, and so therefore many times we are not aware of it. Right? And of course, naturally those over time, it, it plays on our body. I'm going to go through quickly the, um, the things, and then of course, we, I'm giving you the, the, the bad first, and then I, 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 I finish with the good. All right, so the next one would be, uh, which is connected to before, eating when you are not hungry. Now, um, we have a culture here, I mean, and it, it's only when I came to the UK. I've been here all, six years now, um, probably too long. Um, and I, I found that going into, I, 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 I teach, as I said, and so therefore, there's always snacks. Um, what, what do you call them in the, in the workplace? There's a, 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 an era, eh? a cake island, right. right. So there's always something there. And of course, for the persons who might be struggling with, um, with control, self-control, then it's always going to be a difficulty because you have to be pay, park, passing these, these cake islands and you know, going to and fro in order to, to get that. Right? That doesn't help. So naturally, it leads us to snacking. All right, so there, are, of course, there's also emotional eating, uh, nighttime eating. If we're staying up late, then naturally we're going to snack on things. Um, if we go to certain social events, um, we might eat a little bit more than we normally do because um, it is there. But the fact of the matter is that consuming extra calories may cause you to become overweight, and, and we know that. 
any excess weight increases the risk of naturally health problems such as diabetes 2, high blood pressure, heart disease and strokes, certain types of cancer, kidney disease, and sleep apnea. Um, so the whole idea is that we try not to eat too much right, um, at any given point. Uh, I think most of us say that it's three times, no, we, we have meals three times per the day. Um, um, I believe that it, we can actually do with less, right? Less probably is more. Um, the digestive system is as such that anytime you actually have a meal, it actually shuts down the process of actually digesting what is actually there in the system, first of all. That's how it's designed. So in other words, if I have a meal, um, no and I'm gonna eat something in the next two hours, right? Whatever is there, the digestive, it takes anywhere between four and six hours based on what you've eaten in order for it to actually completely go through the digestive system, right? So if I eat something within the next two hours, it means that my body is telling me, you say that um, there's more energy that needs to going back to down what I'm eating currently than focusing what, on what I've actually just eaten two hours ago. So what happens with the, the food that is there? It, it, it stays there, right? Right? It stays there, it putrefies over a period of time, right? Of course, naturally, some of those things that don't break down readily, if we're having meat and stuff like that, then, then naturally that takes even longer to break down. So in other words, it sits there in our intestines for a very long time, all right? It breaks down naturally, the bacteria and different things that are coming up. Um, I'm not trying to scare you, I'm just, I'm just kind of informing you in terms of what is happening, all right? So eating between meals. Um, third one is sitting too much. Um, a sedentary lifestyle has been shown by a, a compendium of studies done in, published in 2012 that sitting for long periods, and that's probably anything over half an hour um, with each sitting, um, exposes us to the risk of obesity, type two diabetes, as well as cardiovascular disease as well, right? Now, of course, we live in modernity, forces us to do that. Most of our jobs, uh, we have to sit in order to do it, right? And um, I think probably that is one of the things that's causing a lot of problems with us these days. Um, so spending too much time in the office chair may also be bad for your mental health, right? Um, our lunch times probably would be much more useful if we are actually spending a little time walking after we have eaten. Usually these days, after I, I, I make sure I eat and then I, I go for a little walk, stroll around the school. Right? Because at least that is going to also help my digestive process, right? Um, studies show people who sit too much are at higher risk of depression. Um, just recently, uh, for the past two years actually, Alzheimer's and dementia has ridden, risen to be the number one killers of UK citizens. Currently, mental health issues um, account for one in four UK citizens and one in three teenage adolescents. So that we have actually a mental health issue crisis on our hands. And I think largely that has to do with our lifestyle. Largely it has to do with our lifestyle. Um, this particular study in the annals of internal medicine says sedentary time and its association with risk for disease incidence, mortality, hospitalization in adults. So all of those things are increased based on how long we are actually sitting um, at any given time. So if we have those kind of jobs, one of the things is just to be getting up probably every half an hour or so, 20 to half, um, a half an hour, and see and move around a bit before we go back to sit down, rather than trying to, to sit for a very long time. This one actually is, um, is a part of it as well, because we might sit, we might lie down, right? It might be different, but watching television, 
So while most people know that becoming a couch potato is bad for your body, research shows that too much TV is also bad for your brain. All right? So is it real? Oh, we're just relaxing watching television. Um, I'm a recovering t um, television addict. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I spent most of my, 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 uh, my early life watching television, and that's the truth. Um, for the past five years, we haven't had a, a television in our homes. Uh, we had to actually pull the thing out, right, and cut off the, right, the sky and, and all of those things that are there. A 2016 study published in um, the Jamaica, um, sorry, the the um, Journal of American Medical Association Psychiatry found that high levels of television viewing and low physical activity in early adulthood was associated with worse midlife executive function and processing speed in midlife, right? Researchers found that people who average more than three hours of TV per day for 25 years perform poorly in cognitive tests compared to people who watch less TV. Uh, just a, um, a little re um, research um, I did, this would have been probably about two years ago, that the average um, teen adolescents in the UK watch um, an average of five hours of television. Per day. Huh? Per day. All right? And that's the highest in Europe. Of course, that is not strange because we are also regarded as the fat man of Europe as well because of our obesity rates. And of course, naturally, the accompanying effects of that as, um, goes, um, goes a far away, All right? So that's an average of three hours. So, ex, you know, so that is something else that we have to be looking at in terms of how we go. But in the interest of time, we're gonna watch that. So watching TV, but also, not just television, but staying up late on other things, other devices, right? So it may not be television that we're on, but it could be your iPads, your iPhones, right? Um, most of us, I'm a teacher, and so therefore I, I have to do a lot of preparation. If you're not teaching, you're preparing to teach. Um, and can I get a little half, a half an hour extra in? Um, just before bed, before I can do that. And I realized that it, it doesn't help in the long run. It's actually better if you go to bed, get the rest, and then wake up earlier the next morning. Um, uh, any of you have heard of Neil Nedley? Neil Nedley is one of the foremost um, persons who wrote a um, book on depression and other persons. He's an Adventist as well. And he will tell you that in his medical career, he went to bed every night at 9 o'clock, and he woke up at 5, consistently. Of course, and of course, the Sabbaths you would be in church, right? Um, he's, um, and of course, the, the fact of the matter is that he performed much better than any of his, his, his peers did um, at that point in time, just because of the consistency. Um, but you might, the fact that there's studies that show that sleep might be almost as important as how much you sleep. So staying up late and sleeping later in the morning may increase the chances that you'll make poor health decisions throughout the day, all right? So it's not just your quantity of sleep, but it's also your quality of sleep, right? Um, the research is showing, and I'll give you a little bit more about that. 2016 study published in the American Academy of Sleep Medicine found that late sleeping time was associated with high Fast food, fast food consumption, higher fast food consumption, and lower vegetable intake. So again, the decisions that we are making are not always the best when we haven't gotten the amount of sleep and the quality sleep that we need to. And this is more common among men. All right? Oh, okay. In addition, people who went to bed later and slept later were less likely to get physical activity. And that just goes... Um, in, in sync there. So the next one is stress. But in particular, stress is an issue for all of us. Um, there's good stress and there's bad stress. Um, but this one is the fact that we are constantly 
rehashing stressful events. All right? So thinking about a stressful event from the past, whether it was five years ago or five minutes ago, um, isn't naturally good for our psychological well-being. This study published in the Behavior Research and Therapy found that ruminating, which is what it is referred to, right, leads to increased depressive symptoms. Right? The more people thought about a stressful event, the more likely they were, were to grow depressed. Researchers found that decreasing rumination helped alleviate um, depressive moods. Right? So less time thinking about what you could have done or what you should have done and focusing on what you can actually do right, in terms of the stress. As, as I said before, cortisol levels, adrenaline, or what you call epinephrine, noradrenaline or norepinephrine are poured into our bodies, um, increase heart rates, increase blood pressure, um, increase, um, well, just everything basically, but also affects um, some of our bodily organ, organs. Um, one of the major things, however, that stressful events do to us, which I believe that we may be aware of, is that it actually compromises our immune system. So at a time like this, when the weather is, is up and down, if we are stressed, it is more likely that we are going to actually contract some, some of these viruses that are going around because our, our, our systems are compromised because of the high stress. Right? Um, well, and it's just physiological. Once the, the stress hormones go there, then they basically, they want all of the, the um, energy to be going to your fight or flight response. And so therefore it shuts down digestion, but it also shuts off your immune system, right? Because there's not enough energy to go around in order to deal with everything. So survival, fight or flight response, right? And everything else, um, it gets compromised. All right. Um, next one, social media. Um, I think both young and old suffer from this one, but this one is not just general. I'm not hitting out on social media. This one is just mindlessly scrolling through so social media. Um, of course, it can be quite addictive, as we're seeing there. So whether you're scrolling through Facebook or enjoying uh, playing on Pinterest, spending time on social, social media may be bad for your mental health. Um, it says, ironically, studies have found that social media leads to feelings of isolation. So the more social media that you actually consume, you know, which is supposed to be socializing in a, in a sense, you actually feel more isolated more detached from persons around you. And of course, if we are anywhere over 20, then we would understand what that means because socializing is really not supposed to be online. It's really supposed to be, be a face-to-face, -face, right, when you're doing that, all right? But that is the norm for our young generation at this point in time. That is very norm for them. Um, I have issues with my students even just concentrating for the hour in class because they have to be responding to their phones um, in the classrooms, right? Um, studies have shown that most people think social media will help them feel better, so they keep going back for more. But in reality, researchers have found time spent on social media decreases people's moods, right? So instead of Inflating and making you feel better about yourself, it actually makes you feel worse. Now, those are the, the seven um, inspired problems. So I want, to, for the next few minutes that we have, to look at the inspired solutions. Quite sure what's hmm? stuck. All right, there we go. So the first one is nutrition. All right, what we want to talk about. So a healthy brain requires a healthy, well nourished body. Research points towards a whole food, plant-based diet of mostly naturally plants, vegetables, and legumes, olive oil, and nuts, 
as optimal nourishment for your brain health. All right? Um, make time for meals and stick to a healthy diet. Eating at regular intervals. And I, this thing, I'm going to be just putting those two together. So both um, um, skipping meals and as well as eating between meals. So eating at regular intervals can help you stay energized and focused throughout the day while also helping you to maintain a healthy body weight. So the reason why a whole food plant-based diet is better for us is because of how the, especially the glucose in the, um, the food is released in the body. If you have any of your snacks, whether it's uh, your drinks or your high, um, your high sugar drinks or snacks, then it is actually releasing the sugar too fast for your brain. So what happens is that the brain will spike. So the sugar levels spike in the brain, and then, of course, after a while, it flattens. Right? But the whole foods, what they are designed and packaged in such a way that the <coughs> glucose is released over time, right? in intervals. And naturally, you will last longer with those because of the, the, the mere fact that it is released less time. Um, so one way of actually just trying to um, look at our weight issues, if we have any of those or looking at that, is just cutting back on our, our white flour, right? So things like your white rice, your white pastas, your... Um, uh, what, potatoes, flour, flour. Potatoes are not bad. They're actually better than the others, right? <coughs> right? So all of those would be good in terms of cutting back on. And just not cutting back, I should say replacing them with the, the whole wheat ones, right? Now it takes a longer time to prepare. It take, thank you. It takes a longer time to prepare, but um, we found that, and my wife can help you with some of the recipes for doing that. It, once we understand that it is it much, much better for our brains, then naturally, um, I believe that's a motivation and incentive for us to be doing it, right? So we don't want to be, be spending time um, at the doctors at any point in time. Um, and I, I believe that we, this is the way that we need to go. Uh, next point is the whole issue. Um, no, I did have uh, some... Bible verses. Genesis 1.29, that speaks to the fact that um, that's what Christ gave us in terms of the original diet, right? Um, as well as Gen Genesis 2.16. And I, I wanted to kind of link that with some of the, the, Bible, the Bible verses that we have as well. So Genesis 1.29 and Genesis 2.16. The next point I want to touch on is moving. Right, Genesis 2, 8, and I think Genesis 2, is it 16, where God placed the man in the garden, right, and to tend and to keep it, right? So God actually gave us in the beginning something to keep us active, exercise, um, which is what we lack these days um, oftentimes, especially if we have sedentary jobs, right? So exercise, we need to get moving. Um, the best exercise for your brain is physical exercise, naturally. Daily exercise increases blood flow to the brain. Exercise also triggers the release of what we call brain-derived neurotrophic factor, the BDNF, which promotes neural growth and survival. Sorry. It also reduces inflammation and supports the formation of long-term memories. Right? So um, I read a book called Spark, um, and... Uh, what the doctor in that was saying is that the exercise is actually more for our brains than for our bodies. So it's really not just about keeping your bodies fit, but actually keeping your brains fit, right? Um, exercise also reduces the risk of dementia and other chronic lifestyle disease. Um, it acts as an antidepressant and regulates mood. So Antidepressants are there, and a number of persons like to pop pills. But actually, if you exercise, it has actually been shown in research to actually reduce it and be far more effective than actually um, going on your antidepressants. 
right? It's naturally it regulates um, the blood and everything that's going to your brain. So get at least one hour of vigorous activity each day. If we can't do that, um, this, the minimum per week that is, um, is recommended is between probably 90 and 150 minutes per week of exercise. All right. uh, walking is an extremely good one um, for you if you can't do um, any other ex um, extraneous one. But of course, if you're going to be doing that, make sure that you're checking with your doctors first um, to ensure that um, you are ready to go that. And my suggestion and recommendation will always be start small and then, and then, and then build up. Right? So start small and then you build that up over time. The other one that speaks to the whole idea of staying up late is sleep. Now, sleep is one of those things that we overlook and um, simply we don't recognize as being very important in our lives. Right? But a good sleep um, is now seen as probably so fundamental because anything that we're going to be learning needs to be consolidated in our brains at that night. If we're not getting the sleep, it simply means that we will not remember much of what we're learning any given day. That's the time when the neurons are actually um, formulating themselves during um, um, restful sleep, right? Um, Sleep is essential for consolidating memories, as I say, short-term to long-term memory, and for draining waste products from the brain. So whatever wastes and toxins are built up over the day are actually released when we actually go to sleep. So can you imagine not actually getting sleep and what that is um, over a, just a week? What that would actually have done to our brains? Right? Because all of those toxins, after a while, build up. So no wonder where we we're running into mental, issue, uh, mental health issues, because we're just not getting the time to release the things from our brains. Right? So going to bed at a reasonable hour and getting up early may be hard to get used to at first if you're a night owl, but over time, it actually gets better. And that's just forming better habits you know, um, over time. Um, Lord says he gives us our, his beloved sleep, so we need to actually get those. Just some additional things in terms of keeping calm in stressful events. So it says not all stress is bad, but chronic stress, especially life events that are out of our control, can change the wiring of our brains. Again, um, if we allow stress to get out of hand, it is actually changing our brains, so we are constantly responding. An amazing research I came across the other day, which actually shows that we can actually pass stress on to our children. Uh, and that, that didn't sit too well with me, but I, I'm saying. But the, and, and the reasons are simple, because stress releases neurochemicals, chemicals and, and, you know, and hormones in our bodies. It simply means that if the child, a pregnant lady, um, she creates that environment, if it's a stressful environment, that child is learning how to respond to the environment internally in order for preparing him for responding to the environment outside that his mother is dealing with. So what we're talking about, not genetics, but also epigenetics, the fact of the matter is that we actually pick up some of those things from, from our parents. But it is important that we, we need to, um, we learn how to treat with those. Too much cortisol, the stress hormone, prevents the birth of new neurons and causes the hippocampus right, to shrink. Um, the hippocampus is a part of our brain that has to do with memory, and it is actually shown in different scans that the more stress we have, the actually smaller our hippocampus becomes. So actually, there's physically, it actually changes our brain. All right? So just kind of think about that. So it naturally reduces our, any, um, our powers of learning, our powers of retaining. And naturally, it also um, reduces our, our, our power to actually deal with stress the, time, the next time it comes around as well.
All right, so you see that's a vicious cycle that is actually created there. Um, so we, can, we need to find time or place to calm ourselves, do pleasurable, pleasurable events, meditate, pray, walk, take a nap, right? Um, just find ways of actually de-stressing and um, something that I believe that we don't do enough of in today's um, modern, modern world. Um, another thing I want to focus on here is connecting. But to connect, we have to first disconnect. So we need to disconnect from the, so much of the social media and all the other different things and to connect um, to other humans, right? And that just sounds probably strange, but the fact of the matter is that we, we are social beings, we are gregarious beings, we need to socialize. But the way that we, we are doing it currently is not the way that is going to help us in the long run. Um, it says, having supportive friends, family, and social connections help you live longer and happier and healthier as well. Um, socializing reduces the harmful effects of stress and requires many complex cognitive functions such as thinking, feeling, sensing, reasoning, and, and uh, intuition. So instead of spending hours scrolling through social media, you're better off investing your time and energy into person-to-person -person interaction. Have lunch with a friend. Call someone on the phone or schedule a dinner with your extended family. Real-life social interactions rather than communicating um, just online. One of my students tell me that they actually sleep with their phones. A really bad idea. Um, not just the fact that the radiation um, levels, but the fact that the matter is you may not actually go to sleep during that period of time. Our exam grades are getting worse as well. Um, challenge. One more thing um, that we want to do in order to keep, so, you know, we want to keep our brains active. We, as I said, we get into habits and we do those things because it, it naturally comes very natural to us after a while, repetition, you know, we get into habits. But if every now and then we, we do something different, one of those things is actually learning new things. So if we, you know, books are, is, a, is an amazing thing. We don't read many books these days. Um, a lot of libraries are actually closing down because of that. But books, um, can you imagine somebody would take probably um, five to 10 years of writing a book, right? Could be autobiographical or biographical. And within a month or two, you can actually download 10 years of information into your brain. Uh, just imagine the, the kind of expertise that if you're reading at least a book a month, you know, what that would actually be doing to us. You know, it's an amazing thing. It's something that I'm challenging my, myself with at this point in time, to read a book, at, at least a book a month, you know, on an area that we are interested in. You know, and if we can actually get that, just uh, get that going, it, it would be a major change. So challenging our brains, uh, doing different things, um, even physically. They have something that they regard, they, they call neurobics. Neurobics is really about just changing how we do patterns of things. So like we brush our th teeth based on the, with the hand that we normally um, uh, use. So whether you're right hand or left hand, we use that hand. But just using the next hand to brush your teeth sometimes in the mornings, right, actually makes a difference to the brain. It actually is igniting different neurons in the brain. Puzzles, um, different things that we can actually do um, from time to time. Just changing a routine makes a difference to how the brain actually functions and how it, um, it um, rewires itself. All right, so constantly challenging the brain. The brain won't explode. Um, Right? It actually is designed for, for challenge, and we don't do that enough. Right? So get out of our, our cognitive comfort zones and do something different, something that we haven't done. I challenge myself. I'm doing new courses all the time online. There are so many um, free courses online these days that you know, it's amazing. So you can be, um, be studying Japanese. You can be doing uh, languages are especially um, 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 very good for, for, um, for changing the brain as well. So any of those things can actually be actually helping you in order to do much better. Juggling. Huh? Juggling. I, I bought myself some, some balls just the other day, right? 
so I have three juggling balls, and I'm, 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 I'm actually practice, practicing that. Juggling is actually exceptionally for actually building your brain. And table tennis is actually a very good one. Eh? Coordination, hand-eye coordination. Table tennis is actually good. We bought ourselves a board as well. I haven't been playing that many, but we, you know. The weather is bad, yeah, the weather is bad. I want to end with this one, and it's on faith. I'm sorry I don't have it on the slide, but it's faith. Because all of this is impossible. It says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And I think of the Blue Zone studies um, that have now discovered that the longest living people, um, um, Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, are among those persons in um, Loma Linda, California. But what those persons had was faith, because they didn't know that by reading Sister White's um, counsels on diets and foods and all those things would actually work. So it was a leap of faith that actually got them to be among those persons listed as those who have the best health and live the longest in the world. That is a faith that we probably are lacking. Now the science is there to actually support whatever we are saying now. The science has finally caught up with Sister White. What she has over 100, probably, uh, over 100 years ago published in many of those books that we're not reading, by the way, right, is now there and can be actually seen in the science that is actually there now. And that's just amazing to me um, um, what that is capable to do. So, um, we need to be faith, have that type of faith. Just a little writing from her. She says that we have come to a time when every member of the church should take hold of medical um, missionary work. The world is a Lazar house filled with victims of both physical and spiritual disease. Everywhere people are perishing <coughs> sorry, for lack of a knowledge of the truths that have been committed to us. The members of the church are in need of an awakening that they may realize their responsibility to impart these truths. Those who have been enlightened by the truth are to be light bearers to the world. To hide our light at this time is to make a terrible mistake. The message to God's people today is arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. All right, All right so from the knowledge of health principles, and of course, our Bible verse 12, 12, Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let us, through what we know and what we have learned over this period of time, let's put them into practice so that we are also renewing our mind. The mind and the body is connected. They are not, they are not separate. They are inextricably linked. And so therefore, whatever affects the mind affects the body. What affects the body affects the mind. And I leave with this. So he said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul. Thank you. Amen. Questions? Yeah, sure. Has anybody got any questions uh, over here? Do you want to come up to the front and then you can use this thing? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma uh, thank you so much, Vaz, Vaz right? Ben Rees. Ven. Uh, uh, ben. It just says Venish, Ven for short. Uh, right. Uh, you mentioned uh, stress yes. as one of the factors that is uh, actually Come affects on to all our, of us. our health. Yes. I came across some Christian literature mm -hmm. which... Uh, they were trying to discuss yoga, yoga. as a way of uh, de-stressing. Mm -hmm. And they were kind of not advocating that uh, for us as Christians. Right. I don't know what's your take on that, if you have got some light that you may shade in that area. <coughs> I don't know much about yoga, but I think yoga comes from um, a, a more Eastern type of um, um, religion and... and um, it's not really about Christ, which is where we are. Um, we are Bible-centered, Christ-centered. And so therefore, 
Um, a lot of those Eastern um, religion has to do with mysticism and uh, different things that may be supernatural as well. Um, my thing is that because I'm not certain what of all of what they deal with, I would I would actually um, try to stay away from 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 yoga. Um, uh, there is enough, I believe, information um, in terms of what we can um, do in order to de-stress rather than going to some of those, as I said, Eastern um, types of traditions, which are not grounded in Christ. Another thing that I understand from yoga is that you're... One of the things I understand from yoga is it's about um, the meditation, meditating. Right. And when you're meditating, you're emptying yourself. Right. And that's the risk, you run a risk. Once you're emptying yourself, right. you're, you're now leaving yourself open to anything, anything coming into, into you, you. Right. you know, we know that um, Christ wants us to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us. Yes. So one way that we can meditate is on meditate on the Word of God. Right. But he, God wants to fill us with His Word. He doesn't want us to empty and leave ourselves void. He wants us to be filled with His Spirit. So yeah. if we're going to go to meditation, I would say meditate upon the Word of God because there are many things in His Word that we can actually meditate on. Take out, take on board, gr and grow with them in you know in spirit and, and in truth. In in any of the um, of course our Bibles, there are, there are so many promises. Um, one book I could recommend to you is Philippians. Um, has many promises in there, and one of the things I'm just saying is that um, do one of our, a, a strong search or anything. Just look at Bible verses that has to do with promises, and if we can actually read those and meditate on those, I believe that is amazing. Uh, there was a point that I went through in my life where um, I had repetitive um, things. Every night I would wake up around the same time, um, early morning. Um, this was a very tough period for, uh, of my life, um, about 2014, uh, just before my mother died, I believe it was. And um, I really stressed out. And um, Isaiah 23, baby, is, is it 23? Um, he that keeps his... 23, 26.3, 26.3, Isaiah 26.3, um, he that keeps his eyes um, on Christ will remain in perfect peace. And I think that's the, the, the gist of it. And that was one of the, the, the books that I kept read, reading over and just kind of focusing on for a period of time. And eventually that actually went, um, the, the, the stresses of that, um, that time went from me. And, uh, but as I just said, just meditating on the promises of Christ you know, rather than on some of those um, different types of um, things. That, there are many of them that they have all these um, there about yoga and other things. But as I said, I would be very careful to, to actually go for those. Any other questions, please? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, only one. <laughs> you were saying about reading, Ben. Yes. Does it make a difference if you're reading it on, on paper or on it does. the iPad? It does. My, my, uh, as I say, I'm a psychology student, and one of the things that you learn is that the mere fact that if you have a book, you, you are actually building many me uh, memory traces on several levels. Um, so, for one, you, you have the book, the physical book, you are feeling it, you're touching it, Right? So that's one memory trace, and of course, it's actually stored at different parts in your brain. So the kinesthetic aspect of it, your touch. You can also sm smell it. So olfactory um, levels, you, when you turn the pages, you're hearing it, auditory. Visual, you're also seeing it. So it hits you on several levels that you would not have um, on your, your devices. So I'm not saying that you don't read your devices, but I'm just saying is that um, you are better able to remember things because of the, the multiple ways that you have of storing the information than when you actually just focus on the, the, the screen. And of course, the white light, dependent on the, type of night, the time of night as well, will actually affect your ability to get sleep. Right. So by the way, we should actually be cutting off all of our devices um, anywhere between an hour and an hour and a half before we go to bed because that messes with our melatonin levels. You're telling your brain that it's not ready to sleep. 
And so therefore, naturally, um, it reduces your ability to get to sleep and sleep restfully um, um, if you do not shut off from that system um, um, earlier than that. And I suffer from that as well, trying to just disconnect from that. But um, what we talk about sleep hygiene, good sleep hygiene is ensuring that you actually disconnect from that at least an hour before and, and, and get that time. Get that time in, in prior and, um, you know, and, and reading probably your lesson studies and stuff like that and de-stress before you go to actually go to bed. And never take the, 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 the things in your bedroom. All right. um, no phones or any devices should be in your bedroom. Yes, sir. Bye, brother. Yes, good afternoon. I'm glad that you touched on the addictive um, the addictiveness of the device because yes. that is linked to one of the number one cause of suicide amongst yes. young people. Yes. yes. Is that attachment yeah. to the devices? And um, also, we have done studies where we found that the device, the, the, the attachment to your device has yeah. the same effect as a, a person who's taking cocaine. Yes. When they, with their withdrawal symptoms and stuff, yes. it's the same pattern that yes. is shown yeah. as to people with their devices. So. Yeah. Your iPhones, if you have iPhones, um, I, um, the iPhone was actually designed to be addictive. Right? Um, I don't remember the name of one of the co-founders of, of it with Steve Jobs. He was saying that they need to be doing something in order to do it. Because the same part, they have done research on, on, on persons with iPhones. And it says that the same part of the brain that is igniting when you're in love with someone, a person, is the same part that is actually lit up um, with your iPhones when you use that. So in other words, your people are actually in love with their iPhones. That's, that's how crazy it, um, where, um, it, it gets. Right? The, so the same areas. Um, when you say iPhone, do you mean smartphone or no? The proper brand. iPhone. When, the you, iPhone, say, the iPhone, when yeah. you say iPhone, you mean iPhone, the brand? The brand, or, right. Or you, are, you mean smartphone? No, I mean that. Um, you, is, is it? Yeah, I mean the iPhone, the actual de um, device. The itself. Apple. Yeah, the, Apple. yeah, yeah. Okay. That's the one, right? I know that, uh, there may, may be others that are there, but that one I know. Um, it was said that it was actually designed that way. Um, so naturally, you get the same kind of dopamine hits, right? And dopamine becomes an addictive um, substance. So naturally, you go back for more of that dopamine hit um, it, um, that triggers your reward centers in your brain. Yes. My iPhone, um, not not on my bed, but on my little bedside table because it has my alarm. Right. So it's dangerous to have it with you then to have it. It there. is dangerous because naturally there is also radiation that actually comes from those phones. Oh, I'll get my husband to wake me up because <laughs> right. he wakes, I mean, he wakes my go. son up and um, <laughs> us on Sabbath. So, I'm um, sure that's a better thing in, in any okay. case, right? You know, yeah. So we have to be careful with those radiation levels. And <laughs> and uh, no, there you go. So there you go. Yeah, you can still hear it. You can still hear it. Yeah. So if you can put it on um, airplane mode, you don't get the radium. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the, alarm, the alarm clock would probably be a better thing to, in order to, to get that, though. Right. Um, they are very cheap these days. Right. Uh, is that we want the phones to do everything with, um, for us the, these days. I mean, it's, it's an it's a alarm clock. It's a... It's a uh, about, uh, a radio, it's uh, everything um, these days, but yes, my brother. Uh, the, the issue of staying up late. So yes. Not that I, I don't refute any of it, the same, but for, for me, yes. and many people like me, I don't have a choice often whether or not I stay up late just because of the nature of my job. Sure. Um, but I do, however, notice when I work a certain shift yes. that biologically I am just a mess. Yes. What is it about... Um, 
the time of day that you sleep or don't sleep versus mm -hmm. because I can still get the same amount of hours of sleep. Right. But it's not the same. It's not the same that type of sleep it, right. for some reason. Uh, I think it's it has to do with the body is designed a particular way, and I use the word designed there because your circadian rhythms. <coughs> I know there are people who work on shift, but the body is designed to actually operate on a certain um, type of rhythm, right? Um, we make adjustments and adaptations as human beings, but that's not how the body was. And so therefore, anything that is outside of what it normally does, right, then naturally is going to affect how it, it, it responds um, in, and, and how it functions um, at its, as its peak, all right? So, um, as I said, we are able to adapt to certain things. Now, I know there are many nurses, and as I said, you're, you're a soldier, right? And, and so so the, naturally, we make adaptations to that, but that it would not be the ideal for the body um, to do. And um, they're saying that anywhere between, what, 9, uh, nine o'clock and 10 o'clock at night is probably the optimum, um, the, the time that you want to go to your bed. The reason for that is that the body produces... Um, melatonin during the course of the day. So the, whatever sunlight is there, it does that. And then, of course, it releases at night at around about those period of time. Now, the more time you go towards 12 o'clock, right, then it simply means that the less melatonin that you will actually have that to give you that kind of restful sleep. Also, it increases serotonin levels. And serotonin has to do with your mood. And so therefore, because of the less melatonin and the increased serotonin, that's why people have terrible moods sometimes um, in the, the following day or when they wake up at a certain point in time. Even though you might sleep longer. You go to bed, you sleep longer, but it doesn't help because you are not actually maximizing those melatonin and reducing those serotonin levels. Yes. Mm. Actually, this is true for the majority of the people, yes. but genetically speaking, there are people, night people, that some people that genetically speaking, they work better at night, mm -hmm. cognitive workers. Okay. Actually, so I am one, I am one of them. Mm -hmm. So at night, uh, everything that I need to produce, um, some cognitive work, mm -hmm. I'm doing it. I am better to do it during the night, even the night, even uh, during the morning. Have you always morning. done it like that? Uh, how long yeah. have you been doing that? Yeah, no, all my life. But actually, mm -hmm. there is it. Uh, the the premium Nobel last year. Mm -hmm. It was some researchers that they proved mm -hmm. that there are genetic um, genetic. Um, so genetic predisposition. Predisposition mm -hmm. for that. Okay. So. I am of them. Okay. Unfortunately. Uh, uh, well, congratulations. Yeah, uh, you're probably an exception actually, to the rule. No, unfortunately, because, you know, you can imagine how hard it is yes. when we live in a world project uh, when, where everything works during the day. During the day, yeah, exactly. Not during exactly. the night. Yeah. And um, when our husband is not the same <laughs> gene, <laughs> so they have a different gene, so... That is true. <laughs> it's, it's, it can be difficult. It can yes, be difficult. Yes, it is. Yeah. I feel your pain. <laughs> That's when your strength can actually become a weakness as well, right? A blessing, a curse. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Ven. That was really inspiring and very informative. So my husband has got competition now because I like looking at my iPhone. <laughs> I have to get rid of it. All right. Well, thank you so much, and thank you. I hope you enjoyed it this afternoon. I hope you've gained a lot of knowledge that you can share with others but also that you can put in practice in your own life. So thank you once more, Ben, and thank, thank you, you for thank Sandra you for coming, us. and for Julian too. Um, we'd just like to have a, a, a special prayer for you all from Haverhill, for the ministry that you all are doing there. So I wonder if the three of you would just like to come and stand here, and I've asked Lambani if he would come and pray for you all, because I know that you've worked to a certain level and you really want to get over that <laughs> level right. and get those people coming into the church. So we just That's want to have a prayer for you. Richard, would you just like to come up as well? And then Nambani will pray for them. Uh, this will be our final closing prayer. So if we could stand, please, if you don't mind. Thank you. Let us pray. 
Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for the wonderful Sabbath day that we have had. Thank you, Lord, for being with us since morning to this uh, time. And in a special way, Lord, we would like to thank you so much for the session that we have just had now. Lord, there are so many things that we have learned. We pray that as we leave this place, may your Holy Spirit seal these words in our hearts. And may you help us to put all these things that we have learned in practice. Lord, we know that on our own, even though we may be willing to do these things, but we cannot without your help. Lord, we pray that you help us. Hold our hands and walk with us. Give us the strength so that we are able to take the next step. In a special way, Father, I would like to pray for our brother and his family and the friend who has come. Lord, you know the ministry that they have engaged in. There are so many people out there who are looking for this kind of information. Lord, we pray that you give them blessings in a special way. Give them the wisdom that they need. Lord, may you give them, may you provide the time to them as well. And may you create opportunities that the message they have, it should go to people who so much need it. We thank you for the privilege that we have had that we have learned from them. Be with them as they live, and may you continue blessing their ministry for the glory and honor of your kingdom. Be with us as we part, and keep us, Lord, until we meet again. For this is my humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So if you can all remember um, to keep the first Sabbath of every month free in the afternoon, make sure you come here. Think of some friends that you might want to bring because this is something what we, that we want to do every month, okay? And thank you once more. That was really, really yeah, good. Thank you. Really good. Thank you. We hope you can come I'm again. Yes, we will definitely have you another time. That would be lovely. Thank you.